Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director of Doc NYC. On this episode, we bring you a discussion from Doc NYC called Getting Political. I talk to four directors whose latest films intersect with politics. The first panelist we'll hear is Michael Moore. Whatever it is, it's been the artists who have been able to be the ones to say first sometimes, this is fucked up. His new film, Fahrenheit 11.9, refers to the date of November 9th, 2016, when Donald Trump won the presidency in the wee hours of the morning. Fahrenheit 11.9 is a scorching political essay laced with Moore's trademark humor. It seeks to examine how Trump came to power and the groundswell efforts to curb his power. Our second panelist is Julie Cohen, half of the directing team behind this year's box office hit RBG about Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Cinema is about making people feel something. And if you can take an issue that's important for people to learn about and make them feel something, if you care more about gender equality because you feel something seeing cute little Ruth Bader Ginsburg planking for a couple minutes, then like, amen. Julie and her directing partner, Betsy West, were previously interviewed on Pure Nonfiction, episode 76. The third speaker is Annie Sunberg, who directs in partnership with Ricky Stern. Their new film on Netflix is called Reversing Row. It traces the history of reproductive rights secured in the 1973 Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade. The film looks at contemporary forces to undermine those rights. There's a statistic in our film. Between one in four and one in three women have had an abortion in America. And I cannot tell you how many emails I've had from people on the pro-life side who say that we are promoting falsehoods. And it's an interesting culture of misinformation. Our final panelist is Stephen Mang. His new film is called Crime and Punishment, now playing on Hulu. He spent three years filming undercover with whistleblowers in the New York Police Department. This opportunity to just deep dive, follow them around, and um, then slowly be introduced to more cops because they trusted us at this point, um, just snowballed. The officers in Crime and Punishment are known as the NYPD-12. They spoke out against the practice of stop-and-frisk arrest quotas that dramatically impact Black and Hispanic communities. The NYPD claims it abolished quotas, but Stevens' documentary presents strong evidence that the system still exists. Our conversation took place on November 9, 2018, marking the two-year anniversary of Trump's election. Just three days earlier, the U.S. midterm election took place, changing Congress to be a Democratic majority while keeping the Senate as a Republican majority. That week also brought reports that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was injured in a fall, cracking three ribs. I started the conversation by asking Michael Moore for his impression of the election results. As far as Tuesday, I, uh, um, while we were making this film, uh, this is everything we hoped that would have happened. Happened on, Well, everything would have been, you know, more than one down, two to go. It'd be like three down. But um, living in the real world, this was a, quite an accomplishment because we're so used to the Democrats blowing it. And um, uh, so to, have, to really have so many new Democrats, young women, uh, people of color, progressive Democrats, winning all over the country. That's what really happened. Different people got on the ballot than the same old party hacks. And, um, and so we're gonna have a very different Congress. We're gonna have different state legislatures, uh, uh, different governors. Uh, the three states that gave you Donald Trump, Michigan, where Tom you and I are from, Tom and I are from uh, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, uh, all went blue on Tuesday. Blue governor, blue senators, blue Michigan, all women running the state. The, all the top four leadership positions in the state of Michigan are all women. And uh, so this is, can only be a good thing. And, um, um, and, and, we, and we flipped two districts with women uh, to Congress in Michigan. 
So, um, uh, so this is, I feel much better today than I did two years ago on this day. And uh, maybe I was a little bit better prepared for it two years ago because I've been trying to tell people for five months that Trump was going to win and I couldn't get anybody to listen to me. So uh, uh, this time I don't think anybody was throwing the party too early and everybody did their work and did hard work uh, right up until the end in terms of knocking on doors or making calls. So I'm happy, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, and as it relates to my film, uh, you know, I hope that, that uh, you know, the million or so people who've seen it uh, since uh, September, uh, I hope it had some little impact uh, on it, and uh, it certainly gave me a platform to, again, be on TV a lot on everything from comedy shows to entertainment to cable news, and, and I got to get the word out there a lot over the last few weeks, and... Uh, so I'm uh, grateful for that. I'm grateful for the people who've seen it. It's a bitter fucking pill to swallow this film. It's uh, uh, people come out of it uh, uh, and, uh, and they go tell people, I had a pit in my stomach for two hours. I cried on and off for two hours. I want to go home and throw up. Uh, so as you can see, it's a big word of mouth uh, movie. But, You're really uh, selling it. It really sells it. It's uh, like ayahuasca. <laughs> It's like it. Uh, whereas, like with it, like well, uh, well, at least one of the films here, you feel uh, hopeful because I actually went home after RBG and and uh, tried to do some more push-ups, not more, just any, because uh, it was so. I felt shamed watching uh, watching her do that and uh, and thinking, wow, we all have got to take good care of ourselves. We've got to live long because we've got to see the better world uh, that we, uh, when we were younger, all started out to make it a better place. So all of us uh, stay alive for longer than Ruth, and I've already uh, offered to donate one of my ribs. So, <laughs> Well, uh, let me uh, move to Julie Cohen, one half of the uh, directing team of RBG with her colleague, uh, Betsy West. Julie, all of us are following uh, closely the news about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who had a fall and reportedly uh, cracked three ribs. Uh, can you give us any insight from... Uh, absolutely. I'm like, m moving from my uh, filmmaker mode to like the legal mode. We were with the making this film to like today. I'm a, I'm a doc. I'm a medical expert. Um, <laughs> yes, I you, you asked for our mood. My mood is cautiously optimistic, uh, both about f following uh, Tuesday's election and also, yes, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's release from the hospital uh, this morning. The, our uh, personal uh, report from the family, even last night when she was still... Uh, in the hospital was that she was uh, feeling good and having uh, gourmet food brought in for her. So, um, you know, this is not actually, I mean, she's made it through colon cancer and pancreatic cancer. And actually, it's not the first time that she's broken ribs. So uh, from having spent a good period of time with her in the making of RBG, like, do never count out Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Like, a few cracked ribs are like... Uh, you know that that's uh, that's small potatoes for her. Um, that said, obviously um, we want her to get well, and we want her to get back in there with Bryant Johnson, her personal uh, trainer. <laughs> uh, Julie, watching the, the events of this week, the election, I wonder what made you think in relation to the ideas in your film. We felt, I think, pretty exuberant watching something that was talked about less on Tuesday night, and has sort of um, you know come more into the consciousness about like. All that flipping, like so many women. And it feels like people stepping up uh, to run for offices where maybe the party institutions haven't always welcomed them with open arms. Um, those women are walking through a door that Ruth Bader Ginsburg helped open for them. And uh, so it just felt uh, exciting to see people who maybe the institutions don't always have the full confidence in them. Like, well, I'm not really sure you can do this. Are you ready? Is it like time? Uh, sometimes you've got to step forward before your time. Uh, RBG certainly did that um, going back all the way to the 50s, 60s, 70s and seeing a younger generation of women uh, do it today and often succeeding with it feels pretty good. Uh, Annie Sundberg, uh, you also have a longtime directing partner in Ricky Stern. Together you made uh, this film, Reversing Roe, that's uh, now on Netflix, uh, tr uh, tracking the, the history of Roe v. Wade and, and the contemporary efforts to strip back those rights. Um, in, in some ways, uh, your film reflects an issue 
that uh, you know more than any of the others that we're, we're talking about in this panel we feel directly uh, affected by um, by elections. Um, what are your reflections on, on the elections? Well, just to uh, first of all, I think I'm going to echo everything that we're hearing here. It's, it was really exciting to see the numbers of women, the new diversity that we're seeing both on the state level and in the House. That I do think will help change things. I hope desperately it will change districting on a state level, which I think will impact a lot of the issues regarding reproductive rights that we looked at. Ricky and I started this film the morning after Election Day 2016. We had been looking at another project very closely, and I think everyone thought things were going to go a different way. And we woke up and we said, uh uh, we got to do this film now. And we were looking originally at how abortion has been used as an effective political tool, because I don't think, at least when I went to the Women's March in 2017, when we're just getting our feet ready into this film, there were two things that struck me. One was um, women under a certain age, in particular, had no idea the lack of reproductive access was a hypothetical for them. And so they were much more willing to contemplate certain restrictions on care and certain laws that seemed tolerable, but not understanding the full picture and also not understanding how it was used politically up until the election with Trump, where he was very blatant about his presidential goals. I think on one level, the midterms are interesting because it's a check in power. We hope, you know, we'll see what happens now with, um, the Mueller investigation. But I also think that um, some of the damage, this election was great on many levels. It's not so great for reproductive care because Trump already has done a lot to put conservative justices in the lower courts that things are already advancing that would never have advanced previously. And so I'm less optimistic in terms of reproductive access. I still think that that's a train that's going to continue down a path until um, potentially a new administration. I think the best fail-safe now is the fact that we have new state legislatures to potentially catch things at the state level. Uh, Stephen Mayne, uh, who directed Crime and Punishment, which is a film about uh, the New York Police Department um, and uh, a quota system that uh, that whistleblowers inside that police department um, are bringing to light uh, around uh, arrest quotas in minority communities. Uh, now, that's an issue that maybe we don't draw quite as straight a line to in national elections. But uh, but to talk to me about what your reflections are around this issue and the elections. Um, you know, that was intentional, actually. And I, we could talk about that a little bit more to not draw that connection, because, um, you know, something you find in law enforcement is that that the kind of polarization you see amongst um, officers really directly mirrors the, you know, the electorate nationally except for the addition of the blue wall of silence, which I think is exacerbated by this issue of race and class, which we are in a moment that is being uh, very much alarmingly used to sort of um, you know, push back the conversation decades at a time. And um, so I, I think while it's really inspiring what, you know, to see this, you know, the flipping of Congress, um, as a new parent of an 11 month old back here, of mixed race, you know, I, um, I'm really excited to raise her, but also really, you know, worried. You know, I feel like um, the, the the conversations that are are happening um, really trickle into the law enforcement space in a way that has a chilling effect. And I think, um, you know, everything comes down to race and class, and we're in a moment when that is being used as a cudgel to to really. Um, actually push back conversations happening in law enforcement as well. Trump actually has, uh, you know, supported uh, stop and frisk blindly. And he, you know, he's an individual who knows nothing about policing and law enforcement and just knows that this is a, a, you know, a nice little dog whistle to throw out. And so, you know, that's, it, it, it's plain idiocy and, and totally alarming. And so I think that, um, you know, we have to really kind of track the conversation nationally as well. And, um, when we talk about uh, films and politics, uh, you know, uh, the big question that gets raised is what, you know, what do films do in the world? You know, how do films uh, affect politics? Should they affect politics? Um, and uh, and I'd like to, yeah, you know, hear from you, uh, your thoughts on that. I mean, Julie, let me start with you. RBG has been uh, a, one of the great box office successes uh, of this year. Not something that maybe everyone saw uh, coming. Uh, but you've had this opportunity over the last several months to be you know, traveling the country and uh, outside the country and uh, hearing audiences res respond to it. What do you think the effect of your film has been? 
Yeah, well, the great thing about documentaries and especially, you know, on substantive issues is like things that people kind of should be educated on, like constitutional law and gender equality, like two words that don't appear anywhere in any blurb or promotional material for our film. Um, you know, the m movies ultimately have to work as movies. They have to, like, intellectual is great, but they've got to hit, like, your heart and your gut. And I know, um, you know, we felt that we felt that from audiences responding to RBG as a person, her, her personal story, the humor, a, a love story that's in there. But like, I felt it seeing all of my colleagues' movies here. I mean, Steven has a protagonist in his movie, um, the, you know, the lead young cop, who whistleblower, who like, I wouldn't necessarily want to see a movie about just, a, you know, oh, quotas in the police department, but like, it's the character. It's this guy who's you know, so amazing that you're like, I'm rooting for this guy, whatever he's about. And then that was my way into this persuasive movie. Like in, an, in Annie's movie, you'll see like, you know, Gloria Steinem, you know, talking about like the, you know, you think of abortion as such a downer, but there's actually an empowering abortion story. And, the, and like, there's a moment, I mean, you, I don't know if you've seen your film in regular theaters as much as just festivals or, but there's a moment in Fahrenheit 11.9 that's like the most diabolically brilliantly edited skeevy combination of footage of Donald and Ivanka Trump, which ends with Michael's voiceover saying like, is this making you feel uncomfortable? And the entire audience, even like at a multiplex, simultaneously, Mita just says, yes. <laughs> like, that's what a movie can do. It can make you feel something in a way that, you know, it's harder for an essay or a, a, a lot of other, or certainly a news segment to do. Like cinema is about making people feel something. And if you can take an issue that's important for people to learn about and make them feel something, if you care more about gender equality because you feel something seeing cute little Ruth Bader Ginsburg planking for a couple minutes, then like, amen. <laughs> Uh, Michael, you've been uh, at this for a while, and I wonder what you think the purpose of your films are. <laughs> well, uh, actually, the first purpose is alluding to what she said, that they, that I, uh, uh, people work hard all week, and uh, if they get to go to the movies on Friday or Saturday night, as a filmmaker, I mostly want them to feel like when they leave after two hours that they say to each other, wow, <laughs> that was a great two hours. Uh, um, whatever you got out of it, whether you learned something, whether it was a good laugh, uh, whether it made you cry, uh, whether you had the pit in your stomach and had to throw up when you got home. Um, but I, uh, I want, I think probably what most filmmakers want that, uh, that, um, that we've made a great film and I've, and I've always encouraged younger filmmakers who want to make political films, uh, to never put the politics first, put the art first, make a great movie. Make a great movie, and then whatever your politics are, whatever your message is, it's going to carry to so many more people if you put it in the vehicle of great art. If you are just focused on making sure you get the, exactly the politics the way they should be and make sure they learn this, and, and then all of a sudden the film starts to feel like a wagging finger or castor oil, and nobody wants that in a movie theater. That's not why you go to the movies. It's okay if you feel that way, but run for office or hold a rally or start a political organization. But why are you making a movie? You're asking people to come in here with popcorn and goobers, and this is the last form of populist entertainment where you can literally afford, you cannot afford to go to Madison Square Garden to see a concert. You cannot afford to go to Madison Square Garden and see the New York Knicks. You cannot afford, you just go down the list of get out of the house. You can't even afford dinner for two with a little alcohol. It's less than this still. And this is the last place where most people, regardless of their socioeconomic status, can get out of the house for a little bit with each other and experience something that's not of their world. And, and we cannot let that die. It's, and, and, and I'm a huge believer in Netflix and, and, uh, and Hulu and, and The Handmaid's Tale and everything, but because um, <laughs> I, I'm... I'm, I personally promote The Handmaid's Tale wherever I go. I don't get paid for it. I just think it's a documentary of the near future, so please watch this TV series. But no, but I, I, just, I just think that, that um, 
Art, you ask this question of where does art and politics, where that convergence is. I think throughout history, it's the artists who have been in the front lines, whether they are writers, whether they're filmmakers, whether they're musicians, whether they're painters, whether they're, whatever it is, it's been the artists who have been able to be the ones to say first sometimes, this is fucked up. And my art is going to boldly get me in trouble by saying this. Uh, Stephen, uh, talking about your film, uh, Crime and Punishment, you spent several years following these whistleblower uh, cops. The film is now on Hulu. It's it's reaching uh, an audience. Um, so what has that um, been like for them and for around this issue and just raising more awareness? What have you seen from audiences encountering this film? Well, I mean, I, I really agree with Michael and everyone's really saying that, you know, you need human stories to unlock complacency. People don't respond to data. They don't respond to really dry journalism. Um, they respond to storytelling. And I think that's kind of our task, right? And that is, in a lot of ways, I, I feel really heartened that there's a great purpose to being a documentary filmmaker. There, you know, it's, it's only, you know, sometimes sustainable, but um, it, it definitely feels more um, necessary. Um, bringing the film out um, to Sundance, you know, we uh, had 20 of the subjects, cops and families, attorneys, and um, they were flabbergasted. And I was kind of, that was the most probably moving moment of my life, watching, um, you know, people in fur jackets just kind of like respond to a stage full of, of New York City cops who were completely shell-shocked to be dropped in, airdropped into this culture. Um, you know, and, and for Hulu to come around and say, hey, we're going to show this to tens of millions of people across the country, um, it's inspiring. And it's um, hopefully this moment that this conversation that has actually been unfolding for many, many years. Um, some of the cops in the NYPD 12, um, you know, have been doing this for almost a decade, trying to get the attention of the public national public, let alone, you know, local New York City public. And and there has never been able to be a, a sustained conversation about police reform because for some reason, maybe it's like sort of the ongoing demise of civil society intersectionally across everything we know and hold dear, perhaps that distracts us. But whatever the reason, we have to have an ongoing conversation because when the government, when our elected officials or appointed commissioners are breaking the law, they have to be held accountable, and the NYPD has been breaking the law. And you know, some people feel afraid to say that um, for good reason. You know, nobody wants to lose their job on the, you know uh, when career you know the salaries are on the line, families need you know need to be fed. But um, it's been an incredible honor to kind of go out on the road with the film with all the cops who um, you know feel really empowered by all of you. Um, but when all of you stop talking about it and sort of look at this as just, look at all of what we're doing as just entertainment, um, and then we move on to the next kind of like juicy documentary story, th that's when these guys lose hope and the blue wall of silence kind of just comes uh, straight back up and we actually, you know, f go backwards in, in progress. So um, that, that's what I'm trying to understand. You know, how do we keep all of these sustainable conversations, not just sort of like the issue du jour, you know, because it's hot on the festival run or some shit like that. Um, Annie with Reversing Row that's on uh, Netflix, there, there is the power of that distribution platform to reach millions and millions of people. Uh, it it uh, went out into the world in September, so it hasn't been that long that it has been out in the world, but what are you hearing back from the film being out in the world? We're hearing, well, first of all, social media is kind of crazy, and I'm sure all of us have experienced that now, and sort of the direct communications that we get from people who've seen the film, people who are supporting it, um, and if you tag yourself and track the thing, all of a sudden you see the currents of how people are starting to talk about it. What I think is really interesting is that we, we were very open. In our film, we have um, conversations with people who are anti-choice, pro-life. We allow them to self-identify as pro-life in the film. Um, and, you know, it's it's... I just want to quickly speak to this idea of how those currents and what you hear come back because 
I think what we've all tried to do, and, and I feel like you did it exceptionally well, is just this idea, Stephen, of like you get inside a world that is not particularly trusting, both of media, of that experience. You're very bold, Michael, about approaching people straight on and putting media right in front of them and whether or not they engage. And then you got the coup of having a private interview in the SCOTUS chambers with RBG. But it's like you're taking people into these very private, personal worlds. And I think once you as a filmmaker, earn the trust in having that dialogue. It's an interesting dynamic because now what we're hearing back is we didn't, we let everybody know prior to the film's premiere at Telluride who was a participant, this is where the film will premiere. We did not, um, we, did not we didn't sort of have a private screening for people prior to Telluride. And it was interesting. We got lots of letters of support from the pro-life people saying, let us know how we can help with the release of your film. And what was interesting in the follow-up was that Operation Rescue is promoting the film on Facebook. And so I'm seeing more people sort of responding to it in that way, which I thought was fa fascinating. In Texas Right to Life, John Segoe was pushing it through Twitter and other ways that way. What we are also seeing is a certain sense of... Um, I mean, Netflix is an interesting platform to work with. They've been unbelievably supportive and they have a great, if anyone you know is working with them, it makes it really easy for educational stuff to happen now. So people, there's just like a splash page and people can connect with a film like that um, and do an event. So we're getting lots of direct queries. What I think is fascinating too though is there's a statistic in our film. It's hovered between one in four and one in three women have had an abortion in America. And I cannot tell you how many emails I've had from people on the pro-life side who say that we are promoting falsehoods. And it's an interesting culture of misinformation. So again, it's like in terms of how the film is reverberating, what the reaction to it is, we're seeing a lot of engagement, but we're also seeing a lot of people continue to push back on what we're presenting as truth in our film. So I don't know if that helps answer the question, but it's an interesting dialogue as a filmmaker. And I also think that to, um, you know, to this conversation about when you are allowed in some, to a community, then seeing how people both respond to that community um, those conversations are interesting to see how people become vilified, demonized, or celebrated. Michael, in Fahrenheit 11.9, you were following uh, some of the uh, insurgent candidates. Some of them you were following uh, long before the rest of the world had uh, heard of them. I, am I right that your cameras were tracking Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, before she won uh, the election? Yes, uh, we started filming her a few months uh, before the election and uh, when she was polling about, I don't know, 3% and nobody knew her, her name or whatever. But uh, yeah, so yeah, you don't know what's going to happen uh, when you do that. And Rashida in uh, Detroit also, we were filming her uh, in advance and uh, uh, they both won. Um, Richard Ojeda in West Virginia, um, sadly he lost, uh, but had the had the biggest flip of turnaround in terms of any Democrat, I think, that was that was on the ballot on Tuesday, even though he lost. He'd, he had really turned that district to being very close to being Democratic in, in West Virginia. So uh, I had the pleasure to host the world premiere at the Toronto Film Festival, and uh, one of the people that um, you brought uh, was a woman from Flint, Michigan, um, who, uh, if anyone who's seen the film will remember her as, uh, as, as someone during the water crisis who has been uh, asked to falsify information and uh, and stood up uh, against that. I would love to hear uh, from you about you know people like that who come up in your uh, in your films. Um, you know what the the connection you feel to them. You know the, these are uh, people who, if your camera hadn't been uh, turned on them, I would not know who that person is. I would not know their story, and now that story will stay with me for for life. I think that, um, well, in her case, I guess this happens to me a lot uh, because I'm fairly public, um, and you can reach me online. Uh, and I don't, I don't have a. There's not a lot of people to get through to to get to me. So um, I I receive so many emails and things on my site from people that have that are essentially whistleblowers that want to share this with me, and then would I be interested in making a film about it or whatever? And I. I get. I actually, it's quite a. I, I try not to feel too overburdened by it because I. I know I can't solve all this, and I can't put them on a, in a film or do a film about their situation. So I feel very close to them in that sense that I. And I feel a huge responsibility, in the case of Flint, for obvious reasons, uh, personal connections and family and stuff. But um, sometimes I think about 
the audience, though, in terms of what I'm doing to them. And I know that when people see this film, they're going to be crushed about President Obama. Because you're criti- you do have some criticism for Obama uh, in this film. It's not, I don't know if it's criticism. I just show what he did. And he depressed the vote in Michigan, along with Hillary, but he did something specifically in Flint uh, by going there and drinking the water and telling people the water was okay when it wasn't. And then after the water crisis, start, crisis started, al- allowed the Pentagon to um, essentially bomb Flint to conduct military exercises to prepare for urban warfare in America by firing missiles into abandoned houses, schools, and having troops para- parachute, paratroop in, come out of helicopters. Um, and after everything that Flint had been through, that they were just target practice uh, for Obama's Pentagon. I knew when people in the theater would watch this that that because I, I don't want to, I can't crush people's spirits. I mean, they've got it. We're already so low and so full of despair, and I have to, you know. But I cannot not tell the truth, and that and that the Trump is in the in in the White House in part because liberals and Democrats are responsible for behaviors that allowed for Trump to happen, um, um, starting with liberals and Democrats in this city who for 40, they had 40 years to stop him. 40 years before he was foisted on the rest of us. And I can't, of all cities, talk about a political city, talk about a liberal city, that he somehow never spent a night in jail, never had to answer for his behavior, got to take out full-page ads calling for the execution of black teenagers who were innocent. On and on and on. I swear to God, I promise you this, had he been from Flint or Detroit, you never would have heard of him. He would have been taken care of a long time ago. You know, so and I think we have to take some responsibility for how Trump happened. So I am worried about, in addition to the people that are in the film, I'm worried about the people who are watching it because, you know, I would have loved to have had the first, seen the first woman president take office. Um, and, and the fact that, and I couldn't, I didn't even put this in the film because I just thought the Obama stuff is going to be so crushing that to remind people that she, you know, 8,000 African Americans stayed home on election day and didn't vote in Flint only. 90,000 Michiganders went to the polls, most of them Democrats, and voted, stood in line for an hour or two, and then voted for every Democrat on the ballot and left the top box blank. 90,000 Michiganders. She only lost Michigan by 10,700 votes. That's how much they hated her, Democrats, liberals, and hated the Democratic Party. And so, um, so when she was fed the questions at the Flint debate, in Flint, they had mothers of poisoned children go up to the microphone and told them that nobody would know the question when it was a lie. She was given the questions in advance, and when the mothers of the poisoned children found out a month or two later that it was a rigged debate, questions to Hillary, not to Bernie, um, they went on TV and said, adios. And then more people stayed home. They didn't vote for Trump. But they said that that's it. So I'm sorry it took so long to answer that. But I, but I really, there's always another character in my films, and it's the person in the audience somewhere in America watching this. And I'm constantly thinking about that because they can't leave this theater just wanting to go drink. <laughs> um, Annie, in uh, making Reversing Row, as you uh, described before, you were really talking to uh, both sides, and um, and I wonder you know, what you brought to those conversations of the, you know, staunch pro-life uh, supporters? One of the things we found was that we've never made gotcha filmmaking. I don't think any of us have, um, except maybe sometimes you, Mr. Moore, <laughs> like in terms of just going at an issue and someone. But we sat with people where we basically really wanted to hear their point of view, and they were incredibly wary to let us in the door. And we had a conversation with a woman who runs a group called Concerned Women of America, which is an incredibly powerful lobbyist organization. They basically were part of the evangelicals that really got the vote out for Trump, and they are mostly Liberty University graduates. They are big Falwell supporters. They are kind of dyed in the wool of a particular type of evangelical voter. And they have big lists and a fair amount of money. And they move um, very effectively in particularly redistricted areas and they get out the vote. 
So we sat down, we were curious to talk to her about how she wanted to, you know, like how she uses, how she speaks to abortion because her entire platform is all about life um, as she sort of gets things before her voters. And she asked me point blank, where are you on this issue? And we had lunch and I have to tell you, it was the craziest lunch ever because I was very forthright. I said, I come from a position of choice. And she said, well, and she basically asked me, have you had an abortion? And I answered honestly. And I said, yes, I have. And it was the most frank conversation that I had with someone on the other side about what it meant for us to be in dialogue together. And she eventually, we did this really weird interview with her because um, she has, uh, she, it's complicated because um, we ended up not using her interview because it was a very specific political interview. But what I found fascinating about it is that she was willing to help us along the way. She gave us lots of introductions to people. She helped arrange interview space for us with other pro-life leaders in DC. And I think she just appreciated the fact that we had a very honest conversation. She knew that we weren't necessarily going to make an essay film that was completely, um, our, our bias I think is clear in the film. I look at this as an issue that affects race, class, and equality, and I also think that it's been used politically in a way that is obscene in this country. But I also feel that, um, you know, the, the people who we did allow to speak to the, to the life issue, we really were looking at the people who use it for political opportunity. And there was one interview that we did not get that I really wanted. It was with Marjorie Dannenfeltzer, who runs um, the Susan B. Anthony list, which is again a political motivating list that basically promotes and supports pro-life candidates. And she declined, um, but she did let us use her office for interviews. It was, it, it was a really interesting set of conversations. But um, I think part of it is just as a filmmaker, you approach people and you are very honest. Um, and we went in from a position of inquiry. We were trying to figure out, is there any compromise on this issue? Can you have a party where you basically, I might have very strong anti-choice feelings, meaning I don't want to see anyone in my immediate community have an abortion, but it's okay, you know, for you to choose that. It's very difficult to see if those two things can live in the same place. So the one thing I was going to say is that I just, I felt like I, I didn't really hit your question earlier. And I think you, in particular, Michael, have had such tremendous box office success that as documentarians, we are so grateful because you've proved the films can have a life in a theater. And to see RBG do as well as it's done this year is also, again, a testament to making films that are about big issues, but they really satisfy and that means something. But the wonderful, crazy thing about our film is that we came out at Telluride and the Kavanaugh hearings were pushed to early September. And Netflix basically said, let's run with this. This is part of the conversation that's happening right now. Let's go out early and let's you know, make this part of this larger dialogue. And when you work with Netflix, you're making a film that's available in 26 languages that can go out to, I can't remember the hundreds of millions of people that it goes out to at the push of a button. And so that kind of immediacy, as someone who might not have a big theatrical distribution behind, that kind of push to get it into that conversation is huge. So it's uh, something that uh, uh, Stephen also enjoyed with Hulu is that ability to go out to all of their uh, subscribers. We, uh, we've just got a couple minutes, Michael. Let me um, wind this up with you. You know, a few years ago, you made uh, Capitalism a Love Story, uh, not long after the 2008 uh, financial crash. And um, at the end of that film, you talked about sort of backing away from filmmaking that you wanted uh, other people to to rise up, that you, you didn't want to be the only or most prominent uh, voice out there. Clearly, you've uh, come back to filmmaking, uh, roaring back with Fahrenheit 11.9, and before that, uh, Where to Invade Next. Um, and I'm eager to know where your energies are right now. Oh, geez. Do I have to get the honest <laughs> answer? <laughs> yeah. I always want to quit. I'm tired. Uh, I see uh, 11 uh, people shot in a synagogue last week, 12 people in a college bar this week, and it just constantly goes through my head, what was the point of making that film? Because I remember when we started Bowling for Columbine, and it was the day after Columbine happened, and there had never been a mass shooting like that at a, at a school like that, and... Uh, and I said to my crew, because we were making our TV show, then The Awful Truth, and I said, we've got to do this because I got, I'm so worried this is going to become a thing now. And, um, and that was our whole motivation, so that it wouldn't become a thing. And now, as we know, it's so much part of daily life that if you turned on the news last night, the killings in Thousand Oaks were maybe the third or fourth or fifth story after the fake attorney general appointment 
Ruth's ribs and uh, a few other things. I uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I on on one hand, um, I I woke up this morning and I thought, oh, you know what? We've got I got to go back to this film we that that I've been wanting to make and we sort of started a, a while ago of how fortunate it is uh, to be a man right now in this era that um, my gender, the, the one with the missing second X uh, chromosome, uh, it's actually, a, it is there, but the fourth quadrant of that second X is missing, so it's a Y. I'm not gonna go into the biology of this for you. The, that we have been running the show for 10,000 years, and the fact that that could change in my lifetime, and that I as a man get to witness the end of men in the sense of running the show, um, that we need to, I need to document this. I need to show the end of the white guy uh, calling the shots. And I think it'll be one of the funniest and, yes, <laughs> and most popular films ever. But it's just, it's just, but it's all from the white guy's perspective of like, this is like if the dinosaurs had had cameras and they could have filmed their end, their, the end point of them. This is the end of this. And it, lucky enough for us, it happened in our lifetime. This is such a blessing. You brought up a great point a few minutes ago. What do we do after we make bowling for Columbine and things don't, not only don't change, but get worse? Or the blue wall of silence goes back up. Um, or, or we end up with six appointments. Trump could have four appointments uh, by the time he's done in 2021, if he's done then, if he'll... You know, if he doesn't get a second term. This is such a profound question that he posed of, of what do we do and how we feel about how we can't, you know, what we can't do um, about it. But um, I know you're out of time, but I just, I'm curious to hear if you had an answer to that or if either of you. Well, I'll just share one quick thought. I think we've overly relied on our audiences being, you know, literate and um, being able to connect the dots, and, and, and they do, and they can, but I don't think that that leads to action. I think that, you know, in some cases of some films, there's like a new burden of responsibility, like filmmakers have to learn how to be impact producers, and I haven't, I'm, I'm an awful impact producer, but I feel like a lot of people ask me, what's your next project? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm trying to make this not just go away, because there's an implication that we're, we're kind of done with crime and punishment, and I, you know, like, I, I, if anything, I'm motivated just by the guilt of feeling like, okay, I, I spent four years filming these guys observationally, and um, I, I really owe it to at least them to make sure this is not in vain, you know, because people being like, oh, wow, that's crazy. He, that guy got retaliated for a winter hat. Like, it's really dramatic. And then move on their way is really missing the point that um, I think we're all trying to achieve, which is, you know, seeing something real shift in not just the culture, but these are all systemic issues. The policy has to be in interrogated. I'm saying as documentary filmmakers, like our lives are hard enough as it is, let's not set the bar like too high for ourselves. If you can edify and illuminate and make people feel empowered and motivated and maybe they'll go out and do a little something and respond to what you've created and move the ball forward, you know, two yards, like it's not nothing. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, some of the problems that we're talking about are like close to intractable. That doesn't mean you shouldn't still push somewhat. It's, it's hard to answer on the Bowling for Columbine thing. Like, it's like I, the, I'm imagining like the 20 year, if the 20 year re, uh, <laughs> like s sequel is com co coming out, like that would be a, maybe another one that makes people throw up afterwards. So, uh, but like that doesn't mean that like, you know, just because everything is, isn't being achieved doesn't mean nothing is being achieved. Let's try to feel like we're going somewhere and keep going there. I just, okay, Sandra Day O'Connor had her final letter. She just sort of, you know, she's stepping off the, st off the stage basically due to um, her health. And I thought she had a brilliant idea. Civics, basic civics education. Because ultimately, we're in a, dem we're in a democracy. This can be our society. Not in school anymore. No one, no one teaches it. No one knows how it works. People aren't running for community boards, school boards, any of that. We're just not, Democrats might show up for midterms. They sometimes show up for presidentials. Yeah, it's just like, let's figure out how this government works and make it ours again. I want to thank our four panelists, 
Michael Moore's latest film is Fahrenheit 11.9. Julie Cohen's film with Betsy West is RBG, produced by CNN and now playing on digital platforms. Annie Sundberg's film with Ricky Stern is Reversing Row, playing on Netflix. And Stephen Mang's film Crime and Punishment is available on Hulu. This panel was recorded at Doc NYC Pro, the industry conference that runs alongside the Doc NYC Festival. The conference is produced by Eric Johnson. Thanks to our team, series producer Sarah Modo, panel recordist Hannah Nordenswan, studio recordist Eric Spink, sound mixer Tom Micah, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at THOM Powers. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. <laughs>